The 18th of May 1974 was the 54th birthday of the then Archbishop of Krakow, <coughs> Karol Wojtyla, who happened later to become Pope John Paul II and in more recent times, Saint. But that was all back in Poland. <coughs> in Melbourne, it was a cold, misty Saturday morning. And into St. Patrick's Cathedral, which looked quite grim, the blue stone on the grey morning, there trooped 21 young men, I among them at the age of, would you believe, 25. And there, 21 of us, this was really the last hurrah of the big numbers, both in seminaries and for ordination. But the 21 of us were ordained by Bishop John Kelly, who was at that stage the administrator of the Archdiocese of Melbourne because Cardinal James Knox had gone to Rome where he was to serve as the prefect of the Congregation for Divine Worship and his successor, Archbishop Frank Little, had not yet been appointed. So we were ordained on that cold Saturday morning in an interregnum. For me it came at the end of only six years of seminary training. I was only partly done as it were because normally one did eight years but I had done three years at the university before I went to the seminary. I had left school with not a thought of the priesthood in my head. I was going to be a diplomat. <laughs> but I ended up a priest and this was the first of many surprises in my life which as I look back has been nothing if not surprising. How could I ever have known on that day 40 years ago that I would stand here as the Archbishop of Brisbane? It seems almost incredible to me as I look back across the landscape of my life. Beyond ordination I served for five years in parishes and got mud on my boots and I look back upon those five years as one of the most crucial times in my life. And then for almost 20 years, not quite, about 18, I studied and taught the Bible. I had never imagined that I would be given to biblical studies, but what greater gift could I have been given by Archbishop Little? Then beyond 20 years, or almost that, of studying and teaching the scripture, I served, and this was another astonishing surprise, for five years in the Holy See, in the Secretariat of State, in the last years of John Paul II. And after four and a half years of service there, I was ordained bishop, and for 12 years I have served as bishop, first in Melbourne, then in Canberra, now in Brisbane, as someone said, next stop, Thursday Island. <laughs> In all of this, and here I state the obvious, I have been a pilgrim, or perhaps a rolling stone is better. At the recent meeting of the Australian bishops in Sydney, I sat as I often do at the tomb of St. Mary of the Cross MacKillop. And on one side of her tomb there are inscribed the words, we are but travellers here. This was absolutely true of her. She was an astonishing traveller, all over the place, indeed the world, as pilgrim or as rolling stone. For me this has been that home is nowhere and home is everywhere. And I think of the words of the Irish immigrants who used to say, and perhaps still do, you are never far from home if you can say your prayers. Those words are simple, but in my experience they are profoundly true. You are never far from home if you can say your prayers. I've never known what homesickness is or what it feels like. I have never missed any place. Occasionally people have said to me, do you miss Melbourne? Do you miss Rome? The answer is no. Home for me is Brisbane. 
Home is nowhere, and home is everywhere, and home, happily, is here. As I look back across the story of these 40 years, I can say that nothing, and I do mean nothing, has turned out as I expected. In fact, it's turned out to be better and richer than what I had in mind. I thought I would be in parishes, and why not? Then I thought perhaps I would teach. Teaching is perhaps the thing that I will do best in life. But nothing has turned out as I expected. I look back upon my ordination, and I can see there what I could not see at the time, that I signed a blank cheque. Had I known that the cheque was quite as blank, I may have hesitated, but sign I did, and blank it was. I have applied for none of the missions to which I have been assigned. People said to me when I went to work in the Vatican, why did you apply for that job? I said, I didn't. I didn't see it coming. How could I? But it's turned out so much better in saying yes to the call, however unexpected, the call that comes from others. I see this as following the Lamb wherever he goes, to use the words of the book of Revelation. To follow the Lamb wherever he calls and wherever he goes, even into strange places like Brisbane, Life ends up far better and far richer than anything we could possibly plan for ourselves. There have, of course, been dark times. Here I state the more than obvious. These have been dark and difficult times through these 40 years. Moments of going into depths of my own weakness and my own woundedness, depths that I did not know were there. But I can see now, as I look back, what I could not see at the time, that those moments and the grappling that they entailed were the most fruitful and decisive moments of my life. To see this was a kind of eureka moment. Now I get it. It came to me with a special vividness when for the first time I taught the letters of St. Paul many years ago now. And I was teaching on the letter to the Philippians and there was a moment there that I will never forget where it was, if I might quote the Acts of the Apostles, as if scales fell from my eyes and I saw the truth of Paul and I understood that it was my truth too. What Paul says in Philippians is, I have come to see now that what's happened to me has served to advance the gospel. What he's talking about is his imprisonment. He was put in prison to shut him up, to stop the gospel, his mission, in its tracks. And what Paul comes to see is that it had the exact opposite effect. It gives his mission, the good news, only greater momentum. Every attempt to stop him and his mission only gives it greater impetus. Then I understood what he meant when he says, when I am weak, then I am strong. It was as if scales fell from my eyes and I saw as if for the first time the truth of the cross as the truth of my life and as the truth of Jesus the good news and hence the rather enigmatic motto that I chose when I was named Bishop blood and water from the wound there comes the fountain of life from the weakness and precisely there the thing that we seek most to escape from or deny from that point there comes the true strength that is the good news the weakness does not have to mean death nor does the wound on the contrary they mean life in the light of Easter some of my year mates have died the 21, some have departed the priesthood and others who have not departed have lived as it were on the brink of a precipice through 40 years. Moments of uncertainty and doubt perhaps about their vocation. 
I can only say that since I entered the seminary on the 22nd of February 1969, a stinking hot summer's day down south, I have never doubted, not even for a moment, that I am where I am meant to be. It may have been dark moments and there certainly have been difficulties, challenges which I felt I could not meet. But none of that has led me to doubt that this is where I meant to be. And here, brothers and sisters, I am talking about the mystery of vocation. I went to the seminary because I felt called. Forty plus years later, I feel even more deeply called. Don't ask me to explain in any great detail the mystery of vocation. It's intensely personal. It is about Mark, and I don't fully understand that. But it's no less intensely communal. I have been public property, more so than ever now that I'm the Archbishop of Brisbane. But that's fine. So I now look to the God who has called me with all of my weakness, with all of my woundedness, and I see him because through all of these years I've never failed to see Jesus. The vision might have blurred, it undoubtedly has from time to time. I have grown myopic and the cataracts of sin have intervened. But through all of these years I've never failed to see Jesus. These were his words in the gospel we have heard. To see me is to see the Father. In the reading from the Acts of the Apostles, Paul spoke of us being companions and witnesses to Christ. He has been a far better companion to me than I to him, but that sense of companionship has never failed. And I have, in the midst of all my half visions, never ceased to witness to the one whom I have seen and heard so that in a moment like this as my life is gathered to a point of focus I can say in the words of Saint Paul as I look back across 40 years there is only Christ he is in everything and he is everything Amen.